Hallelujah. Uh, before we open just in prayer, I just wanted to share something. And that is that God's peace trans, uh, trans, uh, surpasses all understanding. And I just, had just, I just had that just drop in my heart. And I don't know if that's for someone out there on the stream or someone here. just want you to know God's peace surpasses all understanding. And that is when we give our heart to the Lord, when Jesus is living inside us, you know, we have this unspeakable joy that's within us that um, is always there ready um, just to encourage us and to give us strength in times um, of struggle so that we can persevere through and, and get through to the other side, which kind of ties into uh, what I'm about to share about this morning. But let's all first bow our heads and just pray for God's word to just permeate into our hearts. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that you give us this wonderful expression of your love, Lord, that you, uh, through, your, through the scriptures, Lord God, through what you have spoken, Lord, Lord, words that are alive today. So, Lord, we just pray that you just allow your words to seep deeply into our hearts, into our souls, Lord, and minister to us, Lord, so we can become more like Christ and come to a better understanding of what you have for us, Lord God, that um, we're only still just scratching the surface of what you have for us, Lord. So, Father, we just dedicate this time to you, minister to all of our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. I just want to um, just share a, a scripture. Actually, I, this, as I was sort of praying and, and going through what I just sensed God put in my heart to share for today, he just dropped another scripture into my heart, which I just want to share, um, which also ties in nicely with the word for t today. And it's from the Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And it says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. If you can just imagine, you know, you've you got the Apostle Paul, He's um, being buffeted. It says, if you, if you look at the context in which um, the Lord speaks to him with this message, he's being buffeted by, um, by the enemy. And it, says, it talks about the thorn of the flesh being an, uh, a, a demonic um, suppression or a demon trying to suppress him, being able to move forward. And, and Paul is crying out to the Lord and saying, Lord, take this thorn of the flesh away from me. And Jesus' response was, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. And this morning, the title of the message is Survive or Thrive. And here we see in this piece of scripture, Paul's mindset was focused on on the weakness that he was experiencing, that the buffeting that he was that he was enduring, and Jesus had to transform his mindset there from the problem to the solution, so that he can thrive in his ministry into the next stage. And that's where Jesus speaks into his heart about how his grace is sufficient for us. It's not by our own strength, but it's by the grace of God that He gives us. Hallelujah! So I'm going to talk about survive or thrive. And um, I'm going to talk more about how sometimes we find ourselves in a mindset of just being in survival mode. But in fact, you know, God wants to transform us into a, into a mindset of thriving, thriving, not thriving, thriving. And when I think about surviving, I'm automatically drawn to that reality TV show. You know, the one I'm talking about called Survivor. Some of you may have heard of it. I think I've only watched one season of it, and that was the very first season. After that, I just sort of lost interest, um, <laughs> which is probably good, actually, in a sense, um, because there's a lot of things that go on in that show that are, are not too good to take on board. And, and for those who don't know what the context of the show is, basically, a group of people are, are, are selected, be thrown into a situation where they have to basically outlast, outwit, outplay all the other participants so they become the only one standing so people have voted off during the course of the show but the sad thing about it is that as part of the game and they always use it being a game as an excuse people are lying they're cheating they're making friendships breaking friendships at critical times and just so that they can get ahead and this is what survival mode is is really uh, uh, about in a sense 
in the sense that we're thinking solely of ourselves to try and just live one day to the next so that we are, can, st- can, can keep on living, just surviving one day, the next day, the next day. And quite often when we're doing that, we're not living with vision. We're not living with a mindset of thriving. See, because when you're thriving, you're actually in a position where you can give, where you can bless, where you can um, be a tool that God can use um, to uh, minister to uh, someone else, to another, to be able to, to be a blessing to, to those around you. That's what a thriving mindset is, but a surviving mindset is really a, a bit more of a self-centered mindset where we're just trying to get by one day to the next. So we'll look at a couple of definitions. I like to sort of get a bit of a framework around, around the word survive and the word thrive um, before we move forward. So um, in... in uh, in a dictionary, the word survive is, is uh, simply to exist in spite of danger or hardship. So you're living a life of existence. And so this is a mindset which we can be trapped into where we're just living to exist, not with any real purpose, not with any real vision, but just to be. Whereas to thrive is so different. It is to prosper, to flourish, to grow. So if we have a look at um, a bit more deeply into um, being stuck into a survival mode, and I, of course, I delved into the scripture uh, in order to sort of, sort of really flesh out um, how, we, how humanity got into this mindset of, of being in this survival mode. And really, um, it's a consequence of sin. So, but, you know... It, People are often, many of us are born and raised in situations where survival is really the only way of life. And others find themselves in survival mode by circumstances that are out of our control. You know, sometimes we, uh, there are many that are victims of abuse, for example, many who are born in poverty, uh, many who, um, who have been brought up with worldviews that uh, have really set a mindset of, of, of being just being there to exist from day to day. And in Scripture, there are some telling examples of people who have been put in situations or have made decisions where they found themselves in situations where survival mindset was the result of a choice um, and sin. And we, can't, I, we can really look no further to begin with at the uh, the account of Adam and Eve and the sin that, um, that they did. So if you'd like to look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. It says, Now this is after Adam and Eve um, had rebelled against God and taken of the fruit of, uh, of knowledge, which we not, were not supposed to, uh, to do. And they were deceived into doing that by the devil. And God says to Adam, To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat fruit from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. Until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. You see, by disobeying God, uh, Adam and Eve uh, were really placed from a position where they were thriving. I mean, you just think about it. They were um, when God created Adam and and Eve, they were put in the they were placed in the Garden of Eden, a garden where all their needs were met. They uh, had no need to worry about food, no need to worry about shelter. They were in a position where they were thriving. In fact, God placed the tree of life there so that they could live for eternity and so could their descendants live for eternity. God had positioned them to thrive. But instead of... Uh, of uh, living in that situation, they allowed the devil to uh, corrupt their thinking. 
when the devil came to Eve and questioned what God had said to Adam um, about how um, eating of this, uh, this tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil would cause them to die. He, he called, the devil uh, corrupted their thinking about that and, questioned, and caused them to question God. And in questioning God, they made the, the fatal decision, sadly, to rebel against him and take of the, of the fruit of that tree. Now, instead of Adam and Eve being able to continue to, uh, to walk with God, to fellowship with him, you know, God had, you know, Scripture says that God had visited, uh, had walked with them frequently in the garden, you know, because God's desire is for us to be in relationship with him. And, and Adam and Eve had that access to God at that time to be able to live in that wonderful fellowship. So they had everything. But of course, they threw it away when they decided to allow uh, their, their doubt in, who, in what God says to corrupt their minds. And then they, then they took of that fruit. And sadly, um, the consequences of that, uh, of course, of that sin was death. Uh, and they were, of course, cast away from the, from the garden. They were uh, driven out. And uh, uh, God had basically told Adam that for the rest of your days, you're going to have to toil. You know, God never intended for us to toil. God intended us to, to live in blessing, to live in freedom. But, you know, God had said to Adam, look, because of your sin, you, you will toil the ground for, you, for the rest of your days in order to eat, in order to survive. So Adam's mindset in, as, a, as a result of sin became into survival mode. That no longer was he, did he have the, the freedom to thrive because of that separation um, that sin had caused between himself and God the Father. He ended up having to, to now become a survivor and just toil, live day to day to be able to provide for himself, for his wife and for his children as well. To the day that he died, he had to toil. And we can see in, uh, throughout Scripture, you know, the consequences of sin in terms of uh, changing um, humanity from a position of thriving to a position of surviving. And if we look at Romans chapter 3, 23, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So here, everybody has been tainted uh, by sin, sadly, and have been placed in that situation, in that position where we have to just survive in order to get by. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. So the consequences, just like with Adam, for, for sin is death. For, for all. Because all of us have sinned. And, you know, many of us toil and, and uh, try our hardest to be good, to, to live a life of righteousness so we can be accepted, acceptable to God. You know, out in the world, uh, it's common uh, for many mindsets, many uh, val uh, people with, with these sorts of values and worldviews to believe that if they live good enough then, and, and they try and toil hard enough, then they can be acceptable to God. But in, in Isaiah 64, 6, it, it clearly says that all of us have become like one who is unclean for all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We are shriveled, uh, we all shrivel up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. So then no matter how hard we may toil to try to be acceptable to God, we just cannot achieve it because God is perfect. God is without sin. And, and even one little taint of sin is enough to spoil. You know, often in scripture, it talks about how um, uh, a little bit of yeast um, in the, uh, I'm not, look, I'm not a, I'm not a baker, <laughs> but um, a little bit of yeast in the, I guess in the, in, in the bread. Thank you. Spo can uh, you know for the for the Israelites would spoil it because they, in some cases, uh, in their rituals, they had to have uh, take uh, bread without yeast, uh, but it only takes one little grain of yeast to spoil. So just like sin in our life, we are, one little sin is enough to spoil our whole life in terms of acceptability and righteousness uh, to God. 
Now, but there is good news, so let's not just dwell on the <laughs> dwell on that. You know, God has fought, you know, wonderfully has made a way for us, and you know, we sang even today, you know, the song "New Day" about how God has made a way for us. So uh, that is good news. Those of you listening and watching on the stream, um, take heart. There is good news. We can also have a look at treasures on earth and treasures in heaven. You know, many of us, um, uh, or, or many who, who live just to, to live for this life and not even think about the next life, you know, perhaps early, you know, perhaps you've inherited a fortune or perhaps you have worked hard to amass a fortune. You know, here in Australia, and I met, um, all of us uh, who work um, full-time or part-time, um, we uh, part of uh, um, the contribution that is given for our retirement is called superannuation, where our employer gives a percentage of our salaries so that when we retire, there is something there for us to be able to retire on. But that money is invested in, in things like um, uh, the, uh, the stock market or in currency or, in, or whatever it might be. And, and these things are all volatile, like... Um, you know, when the stock market goes down or when currencies drop in value, so too does that retirement fund drop. So we can't, so even though we may amass uh, fortunes for ourselves here on earth, um, it may not necessarily be there when we retire. So we can't rely on uh, our peace being, um, being satisfied by what we are able to do in retire because we don't, we, there's no certainty to that being there when we do retire. And, you know, uh, Jesus actually speaks about this as well, that, um, you know, we try to find, um, uh, our, we, we try to live our lives of thriving through our own wealth. And he says that this is misplaced. And we can have a look at Matthew, and there's no slide for this, so I apologise. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21, which says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, and, and our wonderful Lord and Savior, he, he, he teaches us where we really need to put um, our treasure. And it's not on the earthly things, as lovely as they are, there's no certainty that they will be there tomorrow. But there is certainty and he encourages us and reassures us there is certainty in placing our treasure, our value in him. Because um, that treasure cannot be taken. That treasure sits securely in heaven waiting for us uh, to, uh, to inherit. So because our earthly wealth can be taken away, it, it can diminish our mindset, even though in the, in the worldly we might think we're thriving, we're never too far away from being in survival mode. If possessions are our treasures here on earth because of how volatile this kind of wealth is. And let's have a look at the good news. Um, you know, but before we even do that, I just want to just share a little bit about some who, who, who have no option but to survive in this world. And I think of those, and I mentioned it briefly before, those who perhaps have been abused, those who perhaps were born in, um, in poverty, in, in countries where, you know, which are living in the third world. And, and, you know, our hearts really go out to people who are, who are struggling with those things. But the encouragement that Jesus gives all of us, regardless of where you're at, where you are in the world, what you have experienced in life, the, the, the promise that he gives us is that should we choose to receive him, should we choose to um, surrender to him and to give our cares to him, then he will uh, give us a new, a new life. He'll, he'll um, make us born again as it says in the scripture, and we are able to be transformed into a life where we have purpose, into a life where he will um, give us promises that he will fulfill. And our mindset is able to then be changed. We're no longer in bondage 
uh, to, uh, to just thinking about just surviving one day to the next, but rather he gives us the, uh, the tools um, but in our spirit, but also too in our mind uh, to be able to look beyond that and to live in hope because we know our future is in him. And I think for those who perhaps are li um, living with trauma in their life, you know, that's the only hope that they can really cling on to. Um, you know, there, there's obviously uh, in this world, there's opportunities to try and suppress these things and to try and live life despite them. But Jesus is the only one that can, can, that can heal, that can bring restoration, that can bring new birth to all of our lives, regardless of what our past has been like. You know, I think it's also important to know, too, that when it comes to examples of when people have sinned in Scripture, and uh, particularly um, in the case of Adam and Eve, you know, many of us are perhaps uh, who are Christians are asked, well, why did God put the tree of, of, um, of knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Wouldn't it have been better if that temptation wasn't there? But I think also, too, it's important to note that God was living in communion with Adam, um, in the garden you know, frequently. Like the scripture says that he walked with him. Um, so there was that always that, uh, that support, that love, um, that knowing that, that God, his creator, was always there with him. But also, too, God had, had pre-warned him um, about taking of that fruit. And that warning, you know, Adam was responsible for warning Eve um, not to take of that fruit as well and and Eve knew that too because he she actually mentioned when response to the devil um, about um, being told not to take of that fruit so you know God doesn't just punish us for doing you know for misstepping just for the sake that we've misstepped he he lets us know he lets us know beforehand what is righteous in his eyes and what is not righteous in his eyes and so we have no excuse when we fall uh, because uh, we have been um, pre-warned uh, and, and you know now that we have Christ in our heart you know we, we, we live a life of relationship with God and that so be, just like we, uh, we love our, our family we love our spouses we love our you know children uh, those around us we don't want to harm them we don't want to hurt them and so too because we love God in, in, the, in the same way or even in, in a greater way we, our desire of our heart is, is not to hurt him but to please him As I was been saying, that there is hope. You know, despite our rebellion, God has made a way for us to be redeemed, because Jesus came and died to atone us um, for our sin. He's come to pay the debt, and again, you know, the song "New Day" talks about how Christ came and the debt was paid. God's desire is for us to not live a life of toiling and to find purpose for ourselves. You know, we were, not, we were not created to toil. We were created to thrive, and to thrive in him. You know, instead, we were, um, by receiving Christ in our heart, we find purpose, we find fulfillment, we find freedom, and we find redemption. So instead, his desire is for us to be identified by Christ and to be thriving with our life that is born in that is born in us through Christ and not by the things we have done in the past or, that, or the circumstances we have found ourselves in uh, that have caused us to get to have a survival mindset or through toil and struggle. And I'm drawn to the, to the scripture in Galatians 3, chapter 3, verse 23, which says, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has made known, to which the, lo the law and the prophets testify. So God has laid down the law uh, through Israel so that we know what the standard is. But the right and the verse 22 says, The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. To all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile whether we are born to be children of God or whether we are adopted children of God, that is saying. In verse 23, 
It says, For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory, but all are, test- but all are justified freely by the grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And there you see Paul, you know, speaking about the grace of Jesus, just like as Jesus spoke to him in 2 Corinthians in the opening scripture. Now Paul is testifying about how Christ's grace works uh, in us to change our mindset for him. In verse 25, it says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, not our own, his righteousness, because of his forbearance, that is his patience, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. In verse 26 it says, He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. You see, God did not leave it to us to, to live the righteous life that, is life that is required to be atoned of our sins and to receive eternal life because he knew we'd all fail. His standard is too high for us, no matter how hard we try. And we read the scriptures about, um, about that earlier. But instead, he, um, sending his son Jesus to, to live the life that we ought to have been living. But then in doing so, being the perfect atonement by his death, by the spilling of his blood, but also to by his resurrection and the victory he won on the cross so that our sins can be completely forgiven and that we can live in freedom and that we do not have to be stuck in the mindset of just surviving day to day, trying to work hard to please God or just trying to work hard to be able to live a comfortable life, to live in peace. You know, I was actually when Pastor Lewis prayed, um, in the pre-service prayer, you know, he prayed about God's peace being um, being amongst us today, and you know, that is really what we all desire in life. Whether you know whether you know Christ or not, we desire to to live in peace, to have peace in our heart. And without Christ, it's impossible to to have that perfect peace in our heart. But through Jesus. You know, it's attainable. It's there. It's actually inside us. We just need to allow ourselves to 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 receive it and to live it. But it is there, and that's when we thrive. When we're living in peace, we you know when there's turmoil in our heart. How can we thrive when there's worry and anxiety um, about what is going on around us or what is going on in our minds? But when we allow the peace of God to permeate in our hearts we have victory because we are able to put aside all those thoughts, all those things that would um, work against our peace and rather just focus on Christ and allow him to minister to our hearts. You know, choosing to follow Christ means receiving a whole lot of blessing, you know, a whole lot of blessing. We can't outgive God. You know, we, yes, we, part of uh, receiving Christ into our heart is choosing to follow him. And that requires us to surrender our will to his will uh, and allow him to direct our paths. But that ain't a bad thing because God knows what's good for us. He loves us. And he demonstrates that by sending his son Jesus to the cross to die for our sin and and, uh, to go through all of that punishment that he did. Punishment that we deserve to receive, not him, but he took it in our place. You know, we experience a rebirth that is, we are spiritually awakened. You know, we was, the Bible talks about us being spiritually dead before Christ. But we are totally awakened. We become perceptive to what's going on around us in the spiritual as well as in the natural. We can see how the spiritual world has affected the natural world. We are like, a, in a sense, God uses us as a bridge between heaven and earth. Actually, the Bible talks about that too. That's why we're ambassadors in Christ. We are that bridge. We are that conduit that God uses for us to, to uh, show people that the things of what's happening in this world are really a consequence of what, has, um, what sin has brought to this world. But that there's also the Redeemer, through, uh, who is Christ. So we are spiritually awakened. While, enable, while he enables us to have a relationship with God, 
And we are accepted as his adopted sons and daughters, just as Paul said, you know, regardless of whether we're Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter anymore because Christ has made a way for all of us and we all need to receive him to be, um, to be adopted as his sons and daughters. And there's a whole lot of blessing to come with that as well. And I spoke about that in previous uh, uh, mornings as well, about how we are, are royal because we are his children. All our sins are forgiven because the consequence of sin is now paid for by Christ. He bore the consequence of sin that really we ought to have endured. When he died on the cross and he and we are now clothed with Christ's righteousness and we've got to make sure that our thoughts and our hearts recognize that that we never think that it's our own righteousness. You know, we may um, move on after giving our, our hearts to Christ, surrendering, surrendering to him. There's always the temptation that we believe that we're doing good under our own strength and we must always submit that to God and say, no, it's because of what Christ did that I'm able to do these things. Because Jesus went to the cross without sin so he can bear our sin and redeem us and give us the freedom from sin that we need in order to move on in life and to prosper and to thrive. Because we are clothed in his righteousness, we are also received the promise to thrive. And finally, I just would like to read Proverbs uh, chapter 11, verse 28, which I think really ties in nicely with Matthew 6, which says, Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. And I think that really does encompass that piece of scripture, it really does encompass what Grow Church is all about. Um, thriving like a green leaf because we are righteous through Christ. Hallelujah. Let's help bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you this day. We thank you that you love us so much. And Lord, your purpose for us is to thrive. Lord, we are not merely here on this earth to survive day to day, no matter what our circumstances are in. Lord, whether we live in a third world country, uh, whether we live in, a, uh, in Australia or, in the, or wherever the case may be, Lord God, in our hearts, you have designed us to thrive, to be in communion with you, to have a, a wonderful, thriving, robust relationship with you, Lord. So Lord, we just pray that if any of us here today or any of us watching on the stream are struggling with that, we're struggling from day to day, Lord, I just pray that you will just break that in Jesus' name, Lord. Lord, I just pray that you will just uh, replace that uh, mindset of, of just surviving day to day, Lord, and, and just dwelling on hurts, past hurts or past unforgiveness. And Lord, I just pray for a release of those things in Jesus' name, in, the, in, in those who want to, are, are desperate to move on from that, Lord God. So Lord, I just pray your blessing upon each person here today and watching on the live stream, Lord God. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.